Welcome to the Faith Matters Podcast. In this episode, Terrell Gibbons sits down with Nyland McBain, founder of the Mormon Women's Project and author of the book, Women at Church. Nyland was also a key player in creating the I'm a Mormon campaign. In this conversation, Terrell and Nyland talk, among other things, about her experience as a woman in the church and about how change in the church can sometimes occur from the bottom up. We hope you enjoy this conversation. For more articles, podcasts, and community, go to faithmatters.org. Hello and welcome to another Conversations. My name is Terrell Givens and my guest today is Nylan McBain. Delighted to have you with us in the studio today, Nylan. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to let you do your own introduction. And the way I'm going to ask you to do that is to, to visualize an obituary, what it would look like at, at this point. What are some of the highlights of your life that it might point us toward? Well, I, I struggle when people ask me sort of what what do you do? What do you do professionally? I, I have a that's one reason why I'm asking you to yes. do it because you're hard to pin down. I am hard to pin down, and you know what? I think in recent years I've come to just embrace that about myself. It's just who I am. I, I have a uh, somebody last night who I met for the first time said, "Oh, I, I heard through the grapevine that you're a writer," and I said, "Yes, among, among other, other things, things, I am. I am a writer." Um, I don't know if that's the first word I, and only word I would use to describe myself, but I definitely um, was certainly trained as a writer. I was an English major in college and uh, came out of school very dewy-eyed, thinking I could build a career on um, writing about classical music. So, you know, if I were the person I imagined myself to be in college, I would be sitting on a Tuscan hilltop writing about opera. But alas, real life. Um, so, yeah, writing has always been very important to me, and I, and I, I was trained at a fabulous writing education um, uh, from the, my earliest years growing up. However, my professional experience really has technically been in marketing. Um, I came out of college and worked in the dot-com boom of Silicon Valley, the first dot-com boom, uh, and worked for tech companies there, retail companies, uh, where I was a content producer and an online marketer. And I worked in PR for a while, so wore many hats within sort of the online marketing community there. Um, and I'm also the leader of a nonprofit right now, and I have led a nonprofit for the past 10 years uh, as well. As a, and uh, so I, I like to think of myself as a, um, a business leader. Uh, and I think also I would describe myself maybe first and foremost is sort of a student of communities and a student of human interactions. Um, I'd like to think that that's, that's what I'm perceived as being. That's the sort of common thread right, through all of right. it, is a, is a student of human interactions, a student of human motivations um, and relationships. Good. Well, you didn't mention specifically the three things that I think you're probably best known for. Oh. Uh, founder of the Mormon Women yes. Project. Uh, author of uh, Women in Church, among other women things. At church, yes. I'm sorry, Women at Church. Okay. And uh, the founder, originator, mover of the 2020 Better Days. Yeah. That's the nonprofit that you were. Better Days 2020. To. Yes. So we'll come. We'll come back and talk to that uh, about that in a few minutes. But first, give us give us a little bit about uh, you, your background, and. Um, where you're raised, and just take us quickly through the, the key moments of your life. Yeah. And if you would, could you focus on two or three seminal moments, insights or epiphanies or experiences that uh, you think gave shape to who you've become? Yeah, uh, definitely. So I, I had a very unusual sort of Mormon upbringing. I think there are more more kids that are having this upbringing these days, but um, I was raised as a Mormon in New York City, uh, and I grew up on the Upper West Side. My mom was an opera singer at the Metropolitan Opera, and um, my, my parents were married the whole time I was home, um, but after I was 12, my dad actually lived in an apartment down the hall in good New York fashion. Um, so they were they were separated by by an apartment building floor. Um, and so that relationship, my, the relationship, my parents' relationship, and then essentially my you know formative years as the only child of a single mother uh, were really probably the defining the defining factors of my of my young life. Um, I went to an all-girls school for 13 years, and that was also hugely influential, certainly in the work that I do today for uh, or in women's advocacy. I think it gave me uh, a safe space to to be vulnerable and to develop 
my own sense of self, my own confidence in my academic abilities, in my ability to relate to other women and to see what women are capable of when they have their own uh, space to explore themselves. And so I think for that reason, um, even though, of course, you know, a single sex education and all girls education is meant to be a very, in this day and age at least, uh, a very progressive sort of setting for women, like, you know, sort of overcome the patriarchy and uh, kind of undertones, I think for me it actually emphasized within the church setting the need for a sacred space just for women, specifically yeah, the Relief yeah. Society or for for young yeah. women. Fiona and had a single sex Yes, I know, too. I have that in common with and, Fiona, and yeah, we've talked and about that. And what she that. learned from that is that men are relatively superfluous. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <That was her>. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, yes, spinning that and spinning that differently. I think I do think that both she and I have had that that really wonderful experience of feeling that there's great power in um, sort of intellectual uh, communal spaces for for women, not to mention spiritual spaces for women. So right. I really love that. OK, so pick up the thread way. of your life. then. Oh, well, you asked about a specific experience. Um, I. There, there are two experiences that I that I would um, kind of cite. Uh, one, the first one recurred recurred several times, and it was simply the experience of um, returning to my apartment. I set up this this visual of the two apartments, my dad living down the hall from from me and my mom, and returning back to my apartment. You know, as a sort of rebellious teenager who wasn't getting along with her dad, and um, and coming back to my apartment and, and and praying just up the side of my bed and in my own room and and not always feeling like I was in the right. You know, there were often times where I felt like I had been a jerk and needed to repent, but um, I always knew someone was there. And that just happened over and over and over again as I sort of wrestled through those seven years when I was living at home, but my parents were separated and um, and I, I mean, I just, I, I will swear to my dying day of the reality of of that presence in my room. Um, and then how the old, other... How old were you? Um, well, that, would, that was all through probably 14, 15, 16 yeah. years the old. Critical years. Um, you know, and, and I think also at that time, I just discovered the power of my mom as a spiritual leader. Um, she gave me, you know, she prayed. We prayed at the side of her bed the morning that I left to go to college. I went to Yale, so it was just we were just getting in the car and driving to Connecticut. But um, you know, the, the power of that mother's blessing. Uh, I mean, it was no less powerful than any any priesthood blessing I received. Uh, and so I think seeing her as a leader in our congregation, even if not officially as Relief Society president or something, which she of course did serve as. Uh, you know, at, at one time or another, but just seeing her presence in the congregation, what she was able to do outside of the prescribed um, um, job job right. description right. of a, a Mormon woman was just uh, incredibly influential for me. I, and I think it's where I really came to this idea that as a as a woman in the church, you really have to write your own script. Uh, you know, we, we have this... That bears repeating. Say that again. As a, as a woman in this church, you have to write your own script. Yeah. Our, our men receive manuals full of instructions at every level of, of what they're supposed to do and how the, you know, what the rules are and how they should behave and how they should interact and how they're supposed to be, you know, judging or calling or prescribing or ordaining. Now, um, now, now is that a two-edged... Expression? Oh, absolutely. You mean to, to write your own script? Is absolutely. that a negative because, and a positive? You know, I mean, for somebody like me, I, I love that. I don't want to be told that I have to, you know, perform my role in the church in A, B, and C way. And um, But all for other people, it can be paralyzing because you have this blank page in front of you. Yeah. And you're told, well, okay, that's the opportunity to, to, to explore your own gifts and find your own destiny and, you know, follow your personal revelation. And that can be a terrible burden. A terrible burden for some, and I think that's part of the reason that for so many generations in the 20th century, we kind of adopted, um, you know, high-profile, high-intensity motherhood as what was on that page. Oh well, this is what I'm supposed to do, right? Because there wasn't a um, a, a vocational sort of or ecclesiastical calling that came with women. Um, but it didn't seem a handicap to your mother. Not at all. I mean, you know, I think my mom, my mom has always been 
rather defiant. I tell this great story about her singing for um, Hugh Nibley at BYU in 1965. This was before she was married, before she had had any success uh, in, in her singing career. Um, and she sang a concert, uh, I think it must have been at the De Jong Concert Hall at, at, at BYU, and Hugh Nibley came up to her afterwards and said, Sister Bybee, that's a wonderful talent, but what are you going to do when you get married and have, a child, have children? <laughs> and I said, Mom, you know, what did you say? It was Hugh Nibley, he's towering presence on campus, and she just looked at me like I was crazy. She said, well, I ignored him, of course, you know, <laughs> and that was just the way my mom was. She just yeah. knew it helps when you have a massive p talent like that. Like, like she did as an opera singer. And I think we always in the church have sort of given a free pass to women who have those very ex expressive external talents right. that are hard to deny. Um, we've, done that, we've done that in the arts for, for you know, to, um, I think, with a degree of hypocrisy through the 20th century, where if you are a, a dancer or an artist or a singer, well, of course you need to go magnify your talents. And I think it's only recently that we've said, oh, you're a great you're a talented lawyer or you're a talented doctor or you're a talented humanitarian. Okay, yeah. you know, you go do that too and we're going to celebrate you in that as well. And so I think we're starting to take that sort of, um, that that celebrity worship of of artists um, and extend it to other professions where, where it comes to women. But I definitely benefited from that as I watched my mom as I was growing up. That hypocrisy though was... Was, was a key driver in starting the Mormon Women Project. Because, so, so tell us about that. Yeah, I, I, really, I really wanted to make sure that it was the, the mainstream Mormon woman who was being featured and being set up as an example of how many ways there are to choose the right. Okay, so give us give us the general background to the, to the whole project, because some people might not be familiar with what that is. Yeah, um, if I may, I actually want to go back and just mention the other experience that, that I wanted that was seminal for me because okay. it kind of leads into the Mormon Women Project. Um, I had a, I described my spiritual childhood, my spiritual youth um, as pe very Pentecostal because I had these very big emotional experiences, emotional, emotionally rich spiritual experiences. And one of those was um, the year between my freshman and sophomore year of college, I got to go to uh, an archaeological dig on Tel Megiddo. So this this is a, a tell, a hill, in the Jezreel Valley, just within sight of Nazareth. Um, and my college roommate's father was was a was participating uh, in this program that was leading the dig, and so she and I went. Um, and she she is not Mormon, but we, we were living on a kibbutz there together for the summer. And um, I went to Jerusalem one weekend because my mom was there on a tour, on a, just a very standard BYU tour, and President Hinckley was also there and in town at that time. And so she, so I, I had, you know, peeled off my dirt-encrusted clothes, took the bus to Jerusalem for the weekend. We performed for President Hinckley at the Jerusalem Center, and then I got back on the bus by myself and went back to the kibbutz to, um, at, uh, in the Jezreel Valley. And I remember I got off the bus at the main road, and I had to walk about two miles from the bus stop up to back up to the kibbutz. And um, I just had this overwhelming, um, just plea. I, 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 I expressed this overwhelming plea to be useful to the Lord, and that desire to 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 be put to work, I think, was the result of that Pentecostal upbringing. It was just I just knew that this was something glorious that I was a part of, but I I also wanted to make it better. Um, I just knew that I had been given this really unusual upbringing. I was given this opportunity to live in New York City. I was given this opportunity to perform for President Hinckley and walk through the Jezreel Valley and like things that people you know, most people never get to do. And and I wanted to be useful. The result of that is I wanted to be useful. And so I think that is that that if I've ever wanted anything, it's it's that. It's to be useful. And so I think um that was that's really been the driving factor behind everything I've done, starting with the Mormon Women Project. Um in two thousand eight I saw a number of friends sort of you know, struggling with um, various aspects of church history, of church policy at that time, um, not just about women, but uh, I certainly thought that that 
um, but I did have some experiences where, where women's issues were the catalyst for friends leaving the church. And so, again, I thought, well, you know, I've got this amazing network um, of, of women that have inspired me and have, you know, set a different kind of example for me as I've been growing up in the church. And so why not share their stories? So um, my father actually passed away at that time. And uh, and I, I, for some reason, that was kind of this... I don't know what the connection was, but that was one way one way I expressed the catharsis. And I just started calling up some friends and asking if I could interview them. So did you record these as oral interviews? We recorded, yes. I, I recorded them all as oral interviews, but I always intended to present them as, as, as text interviews. Um, you know, podcasts were certainly popular at that time, but I didn't trust myself technically to be able to edit podcasts as well as I could right. edit text, and I've always just been much more comfortable with text. Um, I also thought text would be easy to scan, um, and text would allow me to sort of present the sheer, the, the impact of the volume that I anticipated um, collecting. How many and have you collected? We've collected over 400 interviews with people in over 22, in 22 countries. And how, how do people access those? Mormonwomen.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we started off exclusively text. We did text for about eight years. And then the last two years, I have stepped away, and I have two marvelous managing directors who have added podcasts. They've added a Sunday School series, which um, stemming from the work or suggestions that I made in my book, Women at Church, um, they've actually created um, Sunday School supplements that bring in quotes from female ecclesiastical leaders, they bring in quotes from our interviews, and they bring in um, female perspective from the scriptures, all to add to that week's assigned Sunday school lesson. So the project's alive and thriving. It is thriving. Continues. In fact, we just did a marvelous series um, that, that one of our managing editors um, just did an incredible job with, based, uh, and the theme was end of childbearing year stories. Mm. And uh, we had I can't remember how many submissions, but we had a lot of submissions, and she went through all of them. And we, this was different. We we limited the submissions to just, um, I think it was 500 words, and we invited people to submit their own stories rather than go out and seek the stories right. ourselves and interview the, the women. And they were just, I mean, I just was in tears by the end of every one of them. You know, women that, you know, you would expect who had had fertility issues or, you know, we had to only, were, were only able to have, um, uh, you know, one or two children, um, and, you know, stories like my mom where, you know, she was not able to have more children. And so it was a source of, of sorrow that that was sort of communally acknowledged, right? If, if you only have one child, well, it's either a choice or something's happened. And But there were also stories that of people you would never have guessed, women with, that have had seven children but wanted more or struggled to get those seven. But the ones that were most touching to me were the ones of women who have never married and who have not only gone through that process of grieving the fact that they'll never marry or or actually, the process of grieving the children comes before the process of grieving the marriage because you always think, well, you can you can get married at any point during right. your mortal life, right? right? But you can't have children at any point, physically, biologically, um, and so that those were the most wrenching stories for me when they got to an age where they thought, okay, well, marriage that door is still open, but I will never biologically have children of my own, and I just that was a perspective that I hadn't really ever. Right. Before. So is there a connection between your work on the Mormon Women's Project and your work uh, for the Bonneville Corporation on the I Am a Mormon project? Yes, and yes. I, so. and, I, and I'm wondering if the moral in both cases is the same. I mean, there were some wonderful caricatures that have been done of the I Am a Mormon uh, videos, right? You know, mm -hmm. taming a lion while you're surfing and, yes. and you know, yeah. painting a, a portrait. Um, but, you know, I'm reminded of, of, of Brigham Young once, just a kind of outburst that uh, occurs in one of his talks where he says, away with stereotyped Mormons, away with stereotyped Mormons. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm frequently, um, I'm frequently told in response to some of my own work that, that well, what you're saying isn't typical Mormonism or you're not, you're not espousing orthodox Mormonism. And I... And I say, well, I'm not sure that there is such a thing. I don't, you know, yeah. this this notion of this kind of homogeneous, um, standardized version of what it means to be a Mormon, or what it what it even means to to define the content of our belief. 
And and doesn't a project like the Mormon Women's Project give the lie to those kinds of oh, impressions? and that was that was the intent from the very beginning. I was so sick of people, you know, I mean, especially going to schools outside of Utah and spending my entire professional life outside of Utah. I was so sick of people thinking that they knew they who knew, I was right. and because of a stereotype. And um, and and and, but I think mostly. I mean, so that was my personal reason. But I think when I saw my friends and colleagues who were struggling to be Mormon women, it was um, it was motivated by a desire to yeah, expand that definition of what it means to be a Mormon woman. Expand the definition, but also emphasize, as I was saying before, that that the the gospel is only a only a value when it's turned into a tool for real living. And and that is where Mormon women's stories have not been told. And so to to see examples of Mormon women taking that gospel, taking that doctrine, and taking that church institution, which is defined as patriarchal, and having it be a um, sort of, you know, stake in the ground or a maypole upon which they build their entire foundation, I think that's, I, I've always felt that that's what's been missing in our portrayal uh, of Mormon women. And I think that the project succeeded in um, highlighting those those private moments of how that translation is made from over the pulpit Mormonism to to sort of by the bedside, yeah. you know, with the Kleenex box Mormonism. And 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 I I mean I yes I was hired to uh, help with the I'm a Mormon campaign in part because of my work on the Mormon Women Project. Um, but as you say, the, the I'm a Mormon campaign was a little bit more of what I had experienced with my mom growing up, where we were taking individual sort of celebrity types and, um, and you know, using, pulling out cinematic or artistic value from what they were doing. Did you feel there was something inauthentic about that? No, no, I, I didn't. I mean, I really think, I understand the need for, for both levels of storytelling, right? I think it's really important for a community to have um, sources of, of communal pride, right? And and it used to be, it used to be the opera singers and you know Miss Americas, and I'm trying to think who else was kind of on that on that circuit with my mom. But today it's the YouTube stars, right? And it's the piano guys, and and I think that's great. And I think we always need to have those kind of communal heroes um, that are publicly out there representing. Oh, in my mom's day, it was a lot of business leaders, right? It was a yeah, lot of like yeah. Marriotts and. Um, Rodney. Ro yes. But I think it's important for us to feel that communal pride and say, hey, we're out there in, in the world and we're doing good things and we're creating beauty and we're adding value. But I also think, of course, um, that it's important for, for something like the Mormon Women Project to exist as well. It was really difficult to go to the I'm a Mormon Project and translate that sort of I'm Mormon, uh, the Mormon Women Project ethos and mission to what they were doing on the I'm a Mormon project. Just because a 4,000 word text interview about a woman's life philosophies and struggles is very different than So the translation minute. wasn't as seamless no. as they might have thought. No, I I was interested in women's inner lives and those don't always translate on video into a three minute pithy. Right, right. Bit, you, know. you happy with the work that was done on the I'm a Mormon project, you think? Was it was it an epical achievement in some ways? Because it, it seemed to be a defining moment in some oh, ways of the I think new it Mormon was, culture. I think it was a hugely, hugely important moment for, for Mormon culture. Absolutely. I mean, I think I don't I don't think it's an overstatement to say that it awakened an entirely new generation of, you know, beard wearing hipster you know risk taking more i mean I, I i just look on instagram or youtube now and i can identify people or you can identify people in your ward who i think were given permission to just just be themselves yeah and and you know not even in a big splashy professional sense but just say hey it it it's okay if I'm going to be, if I'm going to look a little different, if I'm going to pursue a little different career. And I, I, I don't, I don't think that can be overstated. I, I mean, I'm a marketer at heart, so I feel like, you know, I feel like there is tremendous power in putting a story out there and saying you as a community can be this way, even if you're not necessarily that way right now. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I loved that project. Let's talk about another project that came out, I think, of those same years, right, which was your book, mm -hmm. Women at Church. And, uh, you know, a tremendously important book, 
uh, still, it seems to me, it's it reverberates, yeah. and and I think its impact is still felt. And uh, reading your your work in that book, the the label that I would give to you is is you're a faithful change agent. And it seems to me that that's not an easy category to negotiate in our church. And so I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about how do you, how do you, how did you manage to negotiate successfully the tensions between a top-down hierarchical organization, a male priesthood and, and, and government, um, and you're feeling that there were, that it, I, I had this expression that you, your, your insistence that the church is a flexible living organism. Mm -hmm. um, how did this all come together for you? Well, um, I think probably like you and Fiona, when you see the church functioning um, in, in such a, um, well, out, out, you know, in a, in a way that's kind of responsive to the needs of the community, like I did when I was growing up in New York, or when, or in, or in San Francisco. When you see it, um, when you see the, the the people coming before the institution, which is the way I would describe my experiences in those cities, um, I think you're you have greater confidence um, in the opportunity to challenge that institution. Uh, and and, and I, I would describe it that way. I think the people always did come first in my experiences outside of Utah. And that's not to say that my experiences inside of Utah have, have, have been negative or, or but, but I think um, going back to what you were saying earlier about the church experience really being a family and being a haven and a respite for people who are living in areas where the membership is very dispersed, um, People, the people came first, and when they didn't, when the institution came first, there was trouble. People would leave, or yeah. they would get upset, or um, you know, there would be some sort of. Um, I mean, we, I experienced this. There would be some sort of shared um, discord within the ward, and so I feel like um, I feel like I always, I always just felt like I had permission to do that. I, I also, aside from my personal experiences, my, um, I had the opportunity to hear Clayton Christensen speak once um, about how uh, institutional change happened in the church historically. And he's a very big proponent of bottom-up change, disruption, uh, which is his, his famous business theory. And he challenged those of us in the audience to apply sort of that theory of disruption to the church. And he, he said explicitly, having worked with some of the apostles uh, and prophets, that they don't, you know, and as, as prophets have been, I think Brigham Young, right, has, has, has said in the past, we don't want our members to be sheep, right? right. The, that the brethren actually get frustrated when the members act like sheep and that they want us to take initiative and they want us to do what's best for the people. Um, and so I, I, that was a really, that was a, that was a really important experience for me to, because again, it gave me permission to put people before the institution. I like the way you frame that. So it was your belief that one can put people before the institution while still be, still maintaining faithfulness and loyalty to the institutional claims. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I think my perspective has been that, you know, I mean, there, you've got a lot of a lot of sort of doomsday writers right now who are, de de, you know, decrying the end of inst of communal institutions, right? Whether it be religion or it be marriage or it, whether it be loyalty to a school or whatever. But, but um, I think, it, I think, what I probably criticize most is not the institution itself. It's sort of the inflated importance of the institution in our personal lives. Right. And so, you know, I, I mean, I. I think you need an institution to perform our ordinances, which I believe to be at the very crux of our existence and why we're here and where we're going. Um, I don't think you need an institution to decide who's going to open a meeting with the prayer, you know, who, you know, to, to dictate who the person is who's going to open a meeting. Or I don't think you need an institution um, to, you know, yeah, to do any number of other things that, that that there has been overreach. So the wonderful thing about your book is that you made very concrete suggestions, mm -hmm. right? You said, no, look, there are very specific things that we can do to 
more fully address the spiritual capacities, to exploit the spiritual capacities of women and, and uh, involve them more fully in the, in the life of the community. Of the various kinds of suggestions that you made, which ones have elicited the most feedback that you've positive heard about? Positive or negative? Positive. <laughs> Just go with positive. Um. <clears throat> I, for one example, for example, uh, you, you, you relate the story of a woman who held her infant while the baby received a blessing. Yeah. Um, wasn't participating in the ordinance, but there was nothing that explicitly forbade a mother from holding the, the child. I would actually say that that particular suggestion got more negative feedback than positive feedback. The things that got the most positive feedback, and I think the things that people are most comfortable with, um, actually don't touch ordinances. Um, Although was the negative feedback there, from but... from men or women? Oh, both. Yeah. Well, actually, most this, negative feedback is from women. See, that's what Fiona yeah. discovered reading the Relief Society minutes yeah. was that Joseph said to them very clearly, right? Look, I was willing to give you more, but it's it's the inter it's the rivalry among yourselves and the jealousies that have sometimes shut the door to yeah to more prerogatives. No, that's. Yeah, that's been... That's sad. That's been probably <clears throat> one of the biggest takeaways is that... Um, and, and, you know, I think there are many reasons for that, that um, we've been conditioned for generations to, you know, to stop it at certain boundaries and to be concerned about what's appropriate and not appropriate for ourselves. And um, and there are severe sp spiritual penalties, right, that, that if, if you do overstep those bounds. So I understand why the hesitancy... Um, but but it's incontrovertible that, that more negative feedback has come from women than men. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that. But I would say the, for the most most positive feedback and the most changes that I've seen have simply been around uh, uh, counseling and community engagement and listening to our, our sisters, listening to to the women who are officially on a ward council or even just in in, in less official channels. Um, you know, some changes that happened on the very highest levels, of course, were the women who were included into some of the highest, highest councils of the church right. governance, um, which was wonderful. And who knows if that came from my book or not, probably not. But 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 that kind of has has had some some echoes um, from what I've heard on word and stake levels as well, with various bishops and stake presidencies, um, you know, creating positions for women or um, just giving more weight to to those positions. I, I think, as I'm a young woman's president myself right now, and I, it, it's actually very moving to me. Um, as I sit in ward council, you know, there's only three of us in the ward council and there's 11 men, which doesn't make me super happy. But, but at the same time, I feel like it's very moving to me to know that these, you know, small number of girls relative to the whole size of the ward. I mean, I have probably 10 who come, regularly come that so much attention is being given to them and that I have the opportunity to meet re regularly with whoever I want and get the resources I want. At the same time, of course, you know, it's still the bishops and the stake presidents who are sort of taking the lead in, yeah, in, in yeah. including those women, um, which I think, you know, will always be a problem for some. Are you optimistic? I mean, but I'm very optimistic, yeah. I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of optimistic by nature, but I, and I think it's been very gratifying to see membership take the lead in that um, and uh, and I think that 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 will continue I there is a there is a point at which of course the high level leadership needs to set an example above and beyond what is currently happening and um, uh, I I hope that something will happen with that I would love to see the boards of the primary and the relief society and the young women's more thoroughly used. I think that they're terribly, terribly underused right now. I think that we have a sort of latent ministry there that is entirely untapped. Um, I think they're probably kind of bored and wondering what, what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, I would also love to see our female leaders um, uh, trained better in, in speaking, giving more more speaking opportunities, which of course was a really disappointing moment a couple of conferences ago when we only had one female speaker. Um, I'd love to see the number of speakers increased. Uh, in, in opportunities to address the general church. Um, and so I do think that there are some things that absolutely have to happen on the, at the very top level. Um, on the other hand, I, I've been encouraged at the greater awareness and the greater willingness to include women's voices at the local level. Well, you've played a major role in that growing awareness, I think. So oh, I think that's thank an important you. Thanks, I appreciate that. So tell us about the... Uh, 
the 2020 my current project. Yeah, your current project. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so the book Women at Church uh, came out in 2014. By the end of 2015, I had finished doing the majority of the book talks, and I noticed that the conversation was starting to die down a little bit. Um, and of course, at that time, in at the end of 2015, the the focus was more on LGBT issues um, and less on on women's issues, which was fine. But people were asking me, "Well, what comes next? You know, what what's going to be the next thing to get um, this conversation sort of started again?" And and I started thinking about how much I would like for it to not be trauma driven. How much I would love for us to be able to make progress and think about these things meaningfully and in a unified way without there being a shared trauma to, as the catalyst, such as the Kate Kelly excommunication or such as the September 6th excommunication. Um, and so it was around that time, um, at the end of 2015, that a friend of mine, Mandy Grant, was um, reading the biography of Emmeline Wells uh, that Carol Cornwell Madsen had written about 10 years ago. And she simultaneously was reading a number of articles in the news about how horrible Utah is for women and how we're rated low on, you know, most statistics voter that participation. that voter participation, <clears throat> elected office, participation in elected office, uh, corporate boards, corporate executive offices, graduation rates. I mean, every, everything. And, um, of course, we have this burgeoning tech industry here in, in Utah that is trying to recruit women from out of state and retain women. Uh, and so this this is boding very bad for our, our business community here and for our political community. And though and so she was reading these two things and thinking, wow, what happened? And not even so much on a spiritual level. Of course, you know, what happened to the Relief Society is kind of the, the undercurrent of, of, of mm -hmm. her questioning. But really what happened to Utah? Because um, at the time of Emmeline Wells and up until the turn of the 20th century and, and even a couple decades into the 20th century, Utah and its leaders, its political leaders and its business leaders and its secular leaders really prided itself on Utah, themselves on Utah being the birthplace of women's advocacy in the United yeah. States, yeah. which is about the farthest thing we would think of Utah being today. But it was a, it was, that was the standard line, that, you know, that women's suffrage, women's equality was the defining hallmark of the state of Utah. And I mean, when you think of that today, it's just shocking. But um, we got together and we thought, well, this and that is- was, that, was, that was one of a number of indicators that Utah was very progressive when it came to women, right? I mean, higher enrollments in universities, oh, I sending mean, women back to absolutely, medical schools. Absolutely, absolutely. There, there were a lot of we these We were one of the signs. first states to, states to allow property rights. Divorce law was, yeah. was least looser here. Um, so, um, so what did happen? We um, had the first female elected state senator anywhere in the nation. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so Mandy pointed out to me that actually um, 2020 is going to be the 150th anniversary of Utah being the first place in the United States where women cast ballots. And that happened in 1870, February 14th, 1870. So that'll be 150 years to 2020. And what election was that? It was a municipal election in, in Salt Lake City Council Hall, which um, is now up across from the state capitol. It was moved in the 50s from its downtown Salt Lake location. But, um, but and to be clear, Wyoming legislatively gave its women right. the right to vote a month before we did. But we, but we had the first the election. First. Yeah. We, we yeah. exercised the right to vote <clears throat> first. Um, and... And it was a very complicated history after that. I mean, you've got decades of, you know, battling with the federal government over polygamy and, right. and it's very complicated. So we're not in any way trying to wrap that up with a bow and say, you know, Duh, it's done, you know. But um, but we think it's worth celebrating. And because of the ethos that existed at that time and the ethos that existed over the next 50 years was so telling and, and um, so inspiring. Uh, 2020 is also an important year because it's the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote throughout the country. And so groups are already mobilizing and have been mobilizing for quite a while, actually, to celebrate that in a nationwide centennial celebration. And so our goal is to use this very positive, happy, celebratory anniversary mm -hmm. to draw attention to the state of women in Utah. So we are... As a celebration, but also as a challenge. Yes. Right? Yeah, that's right. A celebration, but also as a challenge. Um, I actually, I really like the way you put that because, you know, when we, when we talk to different audiences, we have to be careful about how we, um, sort of 
highlight the negative motivation, the negative aspects that are motivating this project. You know, we don't want to go in saying, look, we're bottom of all of these different metrics. Um, but there is a challenge, definitely, um, intrinsic in what we're doing. And I think we, we've built the program based on the belief that knowledge of those people and events um, that have come before give us permission to do great things in the future. And I think especially for a people like Utahns who are so steeply, so steeped in, in Mormon culture, precedent is very important. History is so important. It's so important. It? And I'm not a professional historian. I'm just, you know, yeah. an average. But, but I have come to, I'm a total convert to the power of history to give us permission and give us a vision and give us, open that door to what can be. Yeah, yeah. Because it's already been. Because it's already been. Yeah. So what are some of the associated projects that fall under the umbrella of this 2020 project? So we are <clears throat> um, kind of like I was doing with women in church. We're doing nothing less than changing culture. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, maybe in that obituary it would say audacious dreamer. I don't know. But um, I, it's, yes, it's a very bold project. But um, I, think we, I think we can do it. We are focusing on education, legislation, and the arts. So um, for education, we have a new fourth and seventh grade Utah Studies curriculum that is being piloted next, uh, next month uh, that includes some absolutely wonderful lesson plans about the history of suffrage and women's advocacy here in Utah. They use political cartoons, for example, to sort of give um, uh, set the scene and, and the political tensions of the day. Uh, as part of that, we are doing a teacher training at the University of Utah next summer uh, for teachers within Utah. And then hopefully next summer we'll do, or 2019, we'll do a teacher training for, for nationwide, a group of nationwide teachers. Um, we've commissioned 50 uh, illustrations by Brooke Smart, an illustrator here in Provo, of key women's activists in the Utah, in Utah history. Um, that will go with the, that fourth and seventh grade curriculum. We are including with that a walking tour of downtown that we hope that will be very high tech so we can have um, visual or virtual and augmented reality elements to it so that kids all through the state um, can have the opportunity to experience it even if they're not able to come to downtown Salt Lake. Um, we also have legislative projects uh, such as taking a commissioning a statue of Martha Hughes Cannon to go to uh, the U.S. Capitol's Statuary Hall in 2020 as part of the 19th Amendment Centennial Celebration. That will be our representation from Utah. Right. She was the first elected female <clears throat> state senator anywhere in the country. And um, so we're getting the bill to have that done passed in the next legislative session. We're working on a license plate template. Um, we're working on voter turnout studies. Um, and then we're also working on uh, in the arts category, I mentioned the illustrations we're doing, but we're also we also have the Utah Suffrage Songbook that we'll be commissioning new music to go with some of these awesome lyrics, um, and that's just kind of the start. So Very exciting. we'll see what the next few years bring. Very exciting. What do you do in your spare time? I, I have three daughters that are absolutely wonderful: the 14, 11, and nine, and um, they are just discovering themselves and it's so it's so exciting to see and yeah, they're yeah. they're so different than I was at, at their age um you know I my 14 year old is entirely a skeptic of and this sort of science science oriented and you know when I was her age I was reciting Shakespeare and just thinking how wonderful fields of wildflowers were <laughs> she's just so driven and so focused and I just love it it's so fun to see her so three daughters up. and raised largely in a single parent family by a mother, you, uh, these issues are very close to your heart Absolutely. Uh, in both directions. But they have a wonderful father too, so that helps. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, Can I ask you a question? You may. Okay. I, I mean, I, I'm very interested about, from your knowledge of um, the way ordinances have always been performed and the way priesthood power has always been performed or been held when the authority of God is on the earth, do you ever see an opportunity for all people to be able to hold priesthood authority? Or do you see the sort of precedent that was set up even at the old times of the Old Testament where just the Levites held yeah. sort of the prophetic... Yeah. Um, I mean, not the prophetic, the priesthood authority. And it seems to me 
one way that I've always rationed our, r- rationalized our patriarchal priesthood is that even from the beginning of time, it's always been held by a certain group, right? And it's and yes, the Levites were a very small particular small group, and now it's all men. But I mean, how do you see that that kind of resonating through history, where the authority to act in God's name in terms of you know ordinance work resides with a certain group of people? I don't know that I have a good answer to that question. I know I was interviewed one time by the Chicago Tribune on the question of women in the priesthood, and. Uh, at the end of the interview, the, the interview, the journalist said, do you anticipate a time when Mormon women will ever have the priesthood? And I said, well, no, I don't. And she said, why not? And I said, well, because this is a church driven by revelation and modern scripture. And she said, well, where in your scriptures does it, does it relegate the priesthood to a male-only priesthood? And I said, I think I'm going to need to get back to you on that. <laughs> and of course, it turns out that there isn't any place in the scriptures that I can find, ancient or modern, where it's, it's specifically mandated that it be a male-only priesthood. Um, so I, I, I like to live in a church in which uh, continuing revelation means the possibilities are always there and always endless. I, I think that N.T. Wright has written very beautifully on this subject, um, not from a political or ideological point of view, but simply as a historian of the New Testament. He says, isn't it interesting that the New Testament writers indicate that the apostles were reluctant to accept the witness of the resurrection? And so women were the first to proclaim it. Mm -hmm. And so he thinks that's an indication that maybe in a new dispensation, new opportunities are there. And of course, we see women mentioned prominently in in offices in the New Testament church. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those suggest that that maybe there are more possibilities there than we thought. I think witnessing is, I mean, if you were to ask me what's the next frontier for women in the, you know, institutional church, what's the next, what's the next change that the the hierarchy, hierarchical leadership could make for women, I would I would say the, the most pressing ones would be around witnessing, yeah. especially with this new policy mm-hmm. that just came out about young men being able to do baptismal ordinances in the temple and young women being able to fold towels. Um, I felt like it was a missed opportunity to be able to say, you know, women can put the name under the little projector or women yeah, can, yeah. you know, sort the cards or, you know, no, do all no. these other things that I think could be categorized under witnessing because yeah, there is yeah. precedent for that. Often. Well, then this takes us back to history. And, yeah. and this is why I, I think, you know, the key to opening the priesthood to all worthy males, the, the groundwork was right, completely laid by Lester Bush and others who did the, the hard work of excavating the history and showing, no, no, Joseph Smith ordained blacks. And mm-hmm. we don't really have revelatory bases for the, the ban as far as we know. And I, 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 I'm really encouraged and pleased to see the caliber of scholarship in women's history that is being done, not just in terms of New Testament Christianity, but in terms of the Relief Society and, and, and the powers and privileges and prerogatives that Joseph Smith bequeathed upon them. And I think that as we continue to excavate that past, my sense is that the brethren are open to what we can learn from that. I hope so. so I'm cautiously optimistic about all kinds of unanticipated developments. But what do you think as a church we're doing particularly well at the present moment? Um, one thing that I think we've always done well and that we're doing particularly well right now, but that we haven't celebrated well enough for a number of reasons is our humanitarian work. I think it's absolutely stunning what we do. I think that there's a dawning consciousness in the church that Zion has to be an interdenominational mm-hmm. and intercultural endeavor, that it's not just about our church. That's so interesting. I mean, because, you know, you've got ideas like, what is that, the Benedict solution, right? Right. Bened- Where the, yeah, what's yeah. the opposite, right? Everybody needs to entrench, and you need to shut out the world. And and I I don't I mean I haven't heard that that's particularly popular with Mormons, but it's not p- particularly appealing to me. Yeah. I like this other model of where yeah we're just arm in arm with the Catholic charities. And I mean, section fifty, the doctrine and covenants, the Lord is very clear where He defines His church as all those people will have Him to be their God, and He says the church pre-existed the restoration. So. Mm. I think we need to expand our vision. Outward. But what do we do about ordinances then? What do we well, do I think, about? I, I think that the church, the way I would characterize it is the church serves as the portal of salvation for the living and the dead, but not the reservoir of the righteous. Huh. That, that's, that's the particular mission and calling the church has, yeah. is to keep those temples up and running like the Sadducees of old, who were the guardians of the temple. Hmm. But that's, that's one of the most important parts of a mosaic that will constitute Zion, I believe. 
I love it. Okay, let's end with one final question. Um, holy envy. Do you have holy envy of any other yeah. religious tradition? I grew up faith? in New York as the daughter of a classical performing artist. Catholics all the way. Okay. They, uh, they, I mean, the art, you know, the art and the, um, I don't know, say what you will about the evils of Catholic Church sponsored art or whatever. But I just Not think, for me. I, I know, I know. And I've, I've talked to Fiona about this and I share this with her. I just think... You know, even even Christmas Eve, we always spend at the Cathedral of the Madeleine here at in Salt Lake um, because that's where I really feel like I'm worshiping. I'm in an active state yeah. of worship. And here in our church, we worship by talking. And sometimes we worship by singing, but it's usually pretty lackluster. So we worship by talking. We worship by meeting. And I don't know. It's just the Catholics. You worship by seeing beautiful things <laughs> and among other things. But I just I just think... The music and the art and the structures, they all lead you to heaven. And um, I, yeah, I've always wanted to. Terrific. Well, Nyland, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you so much. I want much. you to know that I admire you as being a really effective uh, agent of change in a faithful way that I think we are all indebted to. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>